Britain today is in the grip of a religious revolution. The old Church of England is dying, and a new, very different kind of Christianity has come to take its place. There's so much emphasis on anything goes. People can do whatever they like. Man is not free to do whatever he likes. Man is free to do what is right under God. This is the story of the dramatic rise to power of African Christianity. What will be the consequences for British society now that God is black? The Church of England is in the midst of a major crisis. It's lost more than a third of its membership since 1960, and at its current rate of decline, every one of its churches will be empty by the end of the century. It seems to me like we're giving up on God. My name's Robert Beckford. As a Christian and a theologian, I'm deeply troubled by the church's decline. I'm on a journey to discover what the future of Christianity in this country will be. I'm starting off at one of the traditional church's last remaining strongholds in the East Anglian countryside to find out what's really going on. than I thought it would be, but the congregation seems really old. It feels like a church that's running out of time. There's a lot of elderly people within the church. Do you think that in a few years it will be finished? Oh, I hope not. But if you notice, when an elderly person passes on, there isn't anyone come to take the place. This is the trouble. So why do you think the younger people in the village aren't attracted to the church? I don't know. I don't know why they say so many other places and things they can do today. You see, in comparison when I, I was young. Isn't it almost inevitable that with so many elderly people in this kind of village that this church will be closed in a few years? Well, I don't think so. I can't see the church as being closed. I mean, once you've done away with the church, you've done away with everything, in my opinion. Because that is what holds civilization together. Someone said to me in a debate that women should not be priested because they shouldn't have authority and power. And I said in reply that anyone who imagined for one moment that priesthood was power, not so, might perhaps have the wrong idea and possibly, dare one suggest it, be in the wrong calling. The church serves and loves as our Lord and Master did. And we're going to sing hymn number 417. Sally Fogden has been ministering to her parish in Honington for 20 years. I want to know if she can imagine her church up and running for another 20 years. Sally, I've been to many churches where people's ministries are very upfront, very much in your face. I mean, yours is much more gentle, much more softly, softly approach. Is that deliberate? Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. I and mean, that's probably the sort of person I am. But, oh, yes, I mean, I'm not up in there to drag people screaming and kicking into the kingdom. I'm not going to go out like a chi the child catcher in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and drag them all in, but I'm going to welcome them when they come. But do you really feel that the liberal tradition has a future in light of declining church numbers, the rise of evangelical churches? Do you really think it... I mean, it would be tragic for it to disappear, but... Do you really feel it has a future? I oh, most certainly do, because I think that the, the, the liberal church in the countryside is actually fairly confident, you know, and it's fairly busy and it's doing all sorts of things. 
I mean, in these churches that you come to, there's a project on in every church. It's not just sitting there looking at its crumbling buildings saying, oh dear. The liberal church is a fairly confident part of Christendom. I've been keeping a video diary for these films. This is what I recorded after meeting Sally. I like Sally. She's a top vicar. She's the kind of vicar that we'd all want within our churches. But her confidence in the liberals just seems to be a little bit misplaced. It's like the Shires in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, where everything is perfect, harmonious and tranquil. But they're completely oblivious to the war that's raging around them and that's just about to engulf them. The Church of England has never been more vulnerable. And this is the biggest threat it's facing. This is African Christianity. In the name of Jesus. It comes in many forms. It's enormously popular and hugely ambitious and it's spreading across the globe. Amen. We know. In Britain's cities, it's already taken hold. Away for you. I need to know what these new forms of Christianity believe in. What's their message? What makes them so attractive? And what will be their impact on Britain? Hallelujah. To find out, I'm going to explore their roots. I'm going to Nigeria, the heartbeat of African Christianity. This is Lagos. It's the biggest city in Nigeria and one of the most crowded places on earth. And it's absolutely saturated in religion. And this is me, just off the plane. I'd seen dozens of packed out church buses all over the city. I wanted to know where they were going. As soon as we got on the bus, somebody started praying. Then everybody started to pray in unison together. Then they started to sing and sing and sing. Now these are people who don't know each other. An hour's gone by and they're still singing. It's Friday night. I was fascinated. So when everyone else got off the bus, I decided to go with them. I've just got here and there are people pouring through the gates. This is absolutely amazing. There must be seating here for at least 110,000 people. That's 30,000 more than Wembley Stadium. In fact, I was way off even guessing at 110,000 people. What I thought was the church was actually just a tenth of it. And two hours later, the whole place was heaving. This is an event of biblical proportions. There are men, women and children everywhere. There are people as far as the eye can see. Now, I'm not exaggerating. There must be at least a million people out here this evening. This is a church the size of a small city. I want to know what sort of Christianity this is to inspire such an amazing display of devotion. What I was to discover in the next two weeks would challenge everything I thought I knew about the Christian faith.
I've been in Nigeria little more than a day and have already been to a church service with more than a million worshippers. I want to know what makes African Christianity so attractive and what does it believe in? To find some answers, I'm on my way to Abia Kuta, a two-hour drive out of Lagos, where the first missionaries to Nigeria set up their base. <laughs> Visiting the Anglican Cathedral here is like stepping into a time warp. It's an England I thought was dead and gone. I'm really struggling to work out what makes this service African. Apart from the people being in traditional dress and speaking in their own language, there's not a great deal that makes it any different from what I'd see in a church in England. I mean, they're using a pipe organ of all instruments to sing songs. Praise God. It is an European mode of worship that we use. The Anglican Church came from the UK, part of England. And uh, the whole thing there, they brought the whole thing intact to Africa. And uh, when they brought it intact, we sat down, we looked at it, and uh, if, if there is any difference, it will be just a little, a minor, minor difference. Is that building over there? That is the first missionary home built by the missionaries when they brought Christianity to Nigeria. Old buildings in Nigeria either get modernized or bulldozed. But this one doesn't seem to have changed at all since the days of the empire. Everything you can see here, we are attached to the building. So nothing from been the changed. beginning of the building, from the beginning of the construction. Everything you can see, nothing is new. It seems to me that to understand this place, you've, you've got to go back 150 years to the time of the missionaries when you have this Victorian form of Christianity poured into Africa. It's a, it's a form of Christianity that's really rigid. The men are central, it's patriarchal, the women are, are subservient, and the children know their place. These ladies are the mother's union at the church. I asked them about the church's moral teachings. The doctrine of the church is based on the Bible, the complete Bible. Yeah. All right. And so far it's based on that. Of course, it will encourage a strong family life. Teaching of the Bible is perfect. It's perfect. Yes. Christ is the head of the home, then the husband, then the wife, right. then the children. Yeah. Some big women now yeah. are insubordinate. They the want freedom. They want freedom. They want freedom. When you look at the lives of women overseas in, say, Ameri in America or in Britain, and you see the kind of clothes they wear where there's very little clothing on, you know, or you see them with look looking very kind of um, sexy and very, um, you know, um, sensuous, do you think that's a good thing for women to look like that? No. no. Why, why not? <laughs> well, we believe in them. Um, yes, yes, yes. So the church encourages good morals. Yeah. And we believe that you don't have to flaunt 
um, what to have, yeah, especially yeah. with teacher, young girls, the girls, good, that if they just have to well, live a life of chastity, yeah. you know, until marriage. So you like your children to not have sex before marriage? Yeah. 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 You, don't, you don't want them to? No. The attitude of these women remind me of, um, of what my old grandmother used to say. There are no grey areas in the Bible. There's very little room for critical questioning. Everything is clear. You don't have to think too much. And, and it's, there's no room for individual expression because they're responding to me as if they've rehearsed this as uh, like a chorus in, in, in a song. And worse still, it's completely inflexible, especially when it comes to what the Bible has to say about sex and morality. The ladies started singing me the Mother's Union anthem. I find them charming, but their Christianity is pretty hardcore, and the ideas behind it are diametrically opposed to the traditional liberal church in England. I went to see the Archbishop of Nigeria to find out how the Church of England looks through African eyes. He's now the most powerful Anglican in the world, with more churchgoers under him than all the bishops of Britain and America combined. A uh, hundred and sixty years ago, they came here and taught us what not to do and what to do. Our fathers accepted these things. We too accepted these things, and we are struggling with that. Now they come and say, no, you could do those things now. So that, that's the problem. We are, we, are, we, are, we are in a fix, we are in a dilemma. The things they say were wrong, now they are saying it's right. So where do we go from there? Where do we go from there? It's difficult. It sounds to me like the Archbishop believes that England has forfeited its moral right to church leadership. Where was the church when people began to turn against God? Where was the church when the parliament decided to make Sunday a working day and not a worshiping day? Where was the church? Where was the church? When the lawmakers would say it's right for 15-year-old uh, boys to, uh, to be gay or whatever. I mean, where, where's the church in all that? I think Akinola's ideas and influence are a real threat to the UK. It seems to me that if he was to get his own way, the liberal church in England would be completely wiped out. And, and I think that the only form of Christianity that he would want to see would be, would be his version of the African model. But Akinola is not alone. There are 18 million Anglicans in his church in Nigeria, but a further 50 million go to independent super churches like this one. you stand right in the middle of this place, you can't help but be overwhelmed by the sheer size. You're just completely dwarfed as you stand within this building. You see very few new building projects in Nigeria, but independent churches are springing up like mushrooms. Church building is like a national obsession. You know, whenever there are lots of people gathered together worshipping God, there's a great sense of importance and power and community. So you can just imagine what it will feel like when there's 120,000 people here worshipping. They'll, they'll feel like they're actually in heaven. They'll feel like they have the power to do absolutely anything and that their God is more powerful than the government, than the moss down the road and more powerful than anything that Europe has to offer. Places like this ought to be giving church leaders in England just as much cause for concern as Archbishop Akinola because African independent churches are now actively targeting the UK as a mission ground, pulling worshippers away from the Church of England. Praise the Lord! Amen. Oh, welcome in Jesus' name. Amen. I need to know who's behind them and what they stand for. Praise the Lord! I've come to one of the fastest growing churches in Africa to find out more. 
For the church, it's just another ordinary Sunday morning. This man has already spent an hour or so apparently driving out demons, curing cancer, and working miracles. <laughs> he is TB Joshua. <laughs> Prophet TB Joshua. I wanted to know more about this woman, what her life is like and what brought her here. But there wasn't any time to linger or chat. I was being swept along on a PR tour. Everywhere you look, there are people just as desperate, hoping that the prophet will turn their lives around. Like that, this is absolutely amazing. I've never felt anything like that before in my life. It, it's absolutely mind boggling what's taking place. If this is the future for Christians in Britain, then heaven help us. been at the Sunday service at TB Joshua's church in Lagos for about two hours. So far, maybe a thousand people with cancer and HIV have supposedly been healed. Among them are a hundred or so Westerners. I can't help thinking that this might be the shape of things to come for the United Kingdom. If this many people are willing to cross a continent for TB Joshua, then I reckon they might flock to a branch in Britain.
Perhaps the Prophet is thinking the same thing because he's running apprenticeships for young white Europeans. This is Dave, the trainee Prophet. I'd love to know more about these people and how they got here. I'm hoping for a chance to talk to them later on. You might have noticed lots of cameras around. They're not ours. They belong to TB Joshua. And they're not just filming him, they're filming us filming him. I was starting to feel overwhelmed. The people escorting me around the church seemed to me like they were on another planet. Just look at their faces. And they talked about the prophet as if they loved him. In the Sunday school, I came across something that seemed to me just as troubling. It's not God they're worshipping. It's the man in the blue suit. This is one of the prime indicators of a cult. At the end of the day, I was keen to meet the man himself. I had some serious reservations about what I'd seen in the church. This is what I recorded in my video diary. Out of all of the millions of words that are contained within the Bible and, and the thousands of theological ideas, it seems to me that Pastor T.B. Joshua bases the whole of his ministry on eight words in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, forget justice, forget mercy, forget the grace of God, all that's neglected. And I just think that's a complete corruption of the real meaning of Christianity. I wanted to know how come Joshua's church had become so successful. Could you tell me something about the history of this church? When did it all begin? Well, it is not by path and it's not by mind. I will take you to the book of uh, Titus today. We say, God choosing the grace rather than work. Not the work of righteousness which I have done. Now I'm a theologian, and even I haven't got a clue what he's talking about. And his answers to pretty much all my questions were just as opaque. But that's not stopping his followers from hanging on every word. It all started in the same way the apostle of the old, which I know you are a Christian. Going back to your, your, your question. Now I think he's flirting with me. Uh, if I start telling you here, we're not going to leave here. Prophet TB Joshua could have been acting during that interview. It could have been a big front. If that was the real man, I really can't believe that somebody that dull, that uninspiring, that sheepish, and that cagey could be that successful. There's got to be some other reason behind it. I think behind all of that, there's somebody who's probably a little bit tougher, a little bit more sterner than he makes out. I felt very confused by the interview, and as I was leaving the church, something happened that I'm still struggling to understand. We're told the prophet had a message for us. It was a general goodwill message. But then I was handed this by one of his assistants. It's a thousand US dollars. That's two years' salary for the average Nigerian. Now we're a rich foreign camera crew. So why is the prophet giving us a thousand dollars? 
His assistant told me it was a gift as a token of the Prophet's appreciation. I've passed his appreciation on to charity. This is what Archbishop Akinola had to say to me about Nigeria's independent churches, like the ones I'd been to visit. In the full glare of television camera, they do miracles. They do all sorts of things, all right? It's church of materialism. They have no gospel of the incarnation. They have no gospel of the passion and cross of Jesus Christ. They have no gospel of the end times. The only gospel they have is of now and money. So, I mean, people truth to them because, like I said, there's so much poverty in the land at the moment. So people truth to them in the hope of getting something. But when they realize that the little they have is being taken over by these prophets, then they run back. But I don't think the Anglican Church has got it quite right on the money issue either. This is what I found at the Anglican Cathedral in Lagos. There's a huge contrast between what you see inside the church and what's outside of the church. Inside, it's spacious, air-conditioned and luxurious. Outside, there are hundreds of poor people begging for food and, and, and just living in abject poverty. In the car park, I've seen more cars and more wealth here than in the whole of Nigeria. And there's a huge gate on the car park making sure that the poor people stay outside and the rich people and their trappings are safe inside. This seems a long way from what I think Christianity should be all about. I was feeling quite depressed about the state of the church in Nigeria. In the middle of a shanty town, put together from driftwood and scrap, I found this tiny chapel. Wow. This is uh, pretty basic. This building has all the trappings of a regular church, but obviously uh, it's, uh, it's, built, it's built like a shack. You know, this to me really symbolizes what church life is meant to be. The church is meant to be a, an everyday place that people can come into and feel at home. And this, this place, for all its basicness, for all its simplicity, has just got a sense of being a real church, somewhere which is meeting the needs of people. Why do you have so many clocks? Why do you have one, two, three, four? Why are the five clocks in the church? Okay. Is, it, is it because the, the, pe the, people, the people like to get the in a hurry? People, the, no, the people, the people when... The people when they see the power of Jesus yeah. and they appreciate you, whether from the deliverance. Oh, so the clocks are, the clocks are like a, a token yeah, of appreciation yes. for the work of the church. Yeah. So because when you tell them that bring money, then we think that because of money we stand here. Oh, right, yeah. People giving gifts mm. is better than them bringing yeah, money, the because if it's money, then it kind of corrupts yeah. things. Yeah. 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 I felt very uplifted by my visit to the Shantytown Church, but that didn't last long, because that same night, I had the opportunity to stay over as a guest of TB Joshua. I find the place very uncomfortable, but I didn't hesitate to accept. Smaller camera this time. I want to know more about these young white Westerners and what they're doing here so far from home. Hi. Hi. My name is Dave. I'm from UK. <laughs> so what happens on a Saturday night? Well, most of the activities are over now, actually. Really? We have evangelical class. People come and hear the word. After my previous visit here, the last thing I was expecting was to be left alone. But this time it feels very different. I think there's something strange going on. Do you want us to come with you? Is that if we come with you? I'll stay here. Okay. All right, sure. Thank you. It's okay. 
there was a woman who was just about to come in and talk to us but they stopped her from coming in because they wanted to brief her before she spoke to us they've been very suspicious of us this time round they're speaking in Yoruba all the time we can't understand the word that they're saying and there clearly is an attempt to keep certain things away from us certain things hidden and to treat us with not with kid gloves but just to be suspicious of us and keep us at an arm's length Later on, I got to chat to a couple of the junior prophets. Hi, how are you doing? Hi. Ryan. Right. Right. Haven't met you before. Robert Beckford, how are you doing? Hi, I'm Annika. Annika from? I'm from the UK. You're from the UK as well? Yes. How long have you been here? Um, and, um, I don't really keep a, a time on how long I've been here because, you know, when I, when I came here, I realised that time is nothing at all. It's not how long you live, but how you live your life that counts. So to me, time, that, that God doesn't look at time. What a weird thing to say. It's just like talking to T.B. Joshua. D don't you miss Derby? Oh, well, to move forward, um, to discover new oceans, I have to leave the shore behind. I was wondering if you could, you could maybe show me your, your room and just to give people a, a flavour of how you, the dorm you live in and how you spend your time, really. Would that be OK? okay um, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure at the moment. Don't worry if your room's not tidy. We'll have to, we'll have to get back to you on that one. We'll have to get back to us on that one. Yeah. All right, OK. All right, OK. <laughs> Whoop. Paul? <laughs> We jokingly wondered on the way here if our room would be bugged, but now that doesn't seem so funny. Bugged or otherwise, as soon as I'd started asking personal questions, suddenly everyone had to leave. They left us alone to watch videos of the Prophet's greatest miracles. And then, just when we were thinking of going to sleep about 11 o'clock, they came back. Hi. So we've got a wonderful plan for you tonight. And we're going to take you to our prayer mountain. It's a place where um, the Prophet goes and prays regularly. It's a beautiful, beautiful place with waterways and canoes. And it's a place where the presence of God is. So we just want to take you there. So if you want to come down to there. Right, thanks. Lagos is pretty dangerous at the best of times, but at night, absolutely anything can happen. The two vehicles were stopped by some vigilantes who argued with our security person who was travelling with us from the synagogue for about ten minutes. I'm quite nervous. I thought we were coming to church to talk to people. Instead, we seem to be in the middle of a war zone, heading to a miniature version of Alton Towers. mountain it's not a physical mountain but it's like spiritually a place where you can come and pray and be with God this is pretty odd I'm sitting in a speedboat going nowhere, in the middle of a lake, in the middle of the night. So don't you run the engine? Yeah. OK. We'll go by foot. Oh, you got your things together. Oh, you are quite prepared to die. One time at Christmas time, you know, he brought all the children in the Sunday school to this area. And he himself drove them on the boats, and uh, you know he, he really enjoys himself here. So. 
why somebody taking photographs of me if we walk along here. Okay. We should come around this way. We're now back on the bumper track going back to the synagogue. That was a really interesting experience. The Higher Mountain Complex is a, a, an island of luxury in the middle of a sea of poverty. There are shanties and shacks all the way going to the complex and all and surrounding it. So, oh, something's happening here. We're now at another. We've been stopped again by some vigilantes on the way back to the synagogue complex. They're very angry about the fact that we're making noise in the neighborhood this late at night. It seems like there's um, some major friction in this area and that we, we've been caught up in the middle of it. Our, our security man, Shola, has now just left the van. And I don't think that's a good idea because he's um, uh, he, uh, is a bit of a hothead at times. The vigilantes are armed with machetes and um, and, and look very, very frightening. Praise the Lord! Yeah. Oh, welcome in Jesus' name. Yeah. This is a world away from the sort of Christianity I was brought up with. If you have HIV AIDS, please come out right now with your family and your medical report. The scale, the noise, and the style of worship are unlike anything I've ever come across. And as you do that, God will bless you in Jesus' name. But the big question is, what sort of impact is it going to have on Britain? Of any part of your body, leg cancer, anus cancer, breast cancer, God will bless you in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord! On my journey through Africa, I've discovered a kind of Christian fundamentalism that's all-powerful and all-encompassing. It regards the UK as a godless country and African Christianity as its salvation. So far, everyone I've met in Nigeria is a staunch believer, but I think there must be more to the story than that. Now I'm on my way to the coast in search of the secret side of African Christianity. I want to know what happens within African Christianity when you don't conform. What happens, for example, if you're gay? What's life like? for gay people in Nigeria? Life for gay people in Nigeria is really, really horrible. It's something that you don't even mention to anybody's here. You don't just let anybody know this is what you do. Otherwise, it is skin their life. Oh, most Nigerian gays call themselves bisexual because family pressure will make you to get married because by the time you start getting to the age of getting married, definitely your family will start disturbing you. Boy, why don't you get married? If you don't have girlfriend, they can even volunteer to get, the, get one yeah, right. for you. Before you know what is happening, you've gotten married. married already. And, yeah, right, right. and uh, 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 making love to a woman, maybe, maybe you can take Viagra or whatever you think that can make you to do it. And you know, uh, once sperm passes, it's pregnancy. It's so, uh, yes. yeah. Is religion partly responsible for the, the kind of homophobia within the country? 
Yes, it's, it's a very, very strong yeah. impact. The, most of them believe that the practice of homosexuals is satanic, it's evil. The money. It's the money. And it's sometimes they say they want to deliver you. Yeah. What have they got to deliver you from? So why do you still go to church? Why? Why? Did I tell you that God made me to be, uh, made me to be a devil? Why wouldn't I go to church? I'm a Christian. Why wouldn't I go to church? If the head of my church had openly referred to me as an abomination, I'm not sure that I'd feel so comfortable turning up on a Sunday. Isn't that part of the reason why they want us to preserve their anonymity? Hasn't Archbishop Akinola made them feel at all alienated? Go to the streets and interview people. How many people know Akinola? Nobody. He's not a face in Nigeria. Nobody knows him, maybe in his community. That's why. So, it's, not, it's not a face that you're supposed to use to yeah, say this is how Nigerians see yeah. it. Because Maybe in his, uh, his, in his community, that's where they know him. If you, if you ask people around here, now nobody knows who he is. So you're saying we shouldn't take Akinola seriously? No, nobody knows nobody him. Knows he's a no, 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 nobody here. I think he's, he's a face outside Nigeria, but here nobody knows him. So he doesn't speak on behalf of all Nigerians? He's not a non-issue. I admire their bravado, but I'm sure they know exactly who Akinola is. He's one of the most powerful men in Nigeria. I'm going back to see him, to ask him about all the things I've seen. What does he think about the liberal agenda? In a world dominated by African Christianity, how does he see the Church of England's future? Man shall not live with man. It's an abomination. Don't do it. The mission of the church is to say no to what God says no. It doesn't matter who is involved. No matter who tries to promote it. If God says it's not right, the church will stand firm and say it's not right. We will accept it. There's more to this issue than just even the scripture. We will become a living stock to the world. The Muslims, the, even the pagans, even the, to, to those who call pagans, you don't talk about sex in the way we are doing now in the Christian community, um, in, our, in our culture. Sex is what you do in the comfort and security of your room. But in your culture, you celebrate it on television, radio, and newspapers. And you make a man to be, having, to be sleeping with another man on television. It's an abomination to us. And if we should endorse what we are doing, that would destroy our testimony. It would destroy our evangelism. It would destroy our church. And so we say, you won't have anything to do with this. Don't do it. Akinola's uncompromising stance over the issue of homosexuality seems set to tear the Anglican Church apart. But the way he sees it, the problem lies not with African Christianity, but with the liberal church in the West. The church in England is very different from the church in Nigeria. It's more, more diverse, more, more liberal. I mean, what would happen if there was an Archbishop of Canterbury appointed who was a, a gay man, would, would, be, would that be a problem for the church in Nigeria? It would be a problem for much of the Anglican world. But certainly, and I can, I can underline that in capital letters, certainly, the church of Nigeria will not endorse such a move. And bear this in mind, it's very painful for me to say what I want to say now, but bear this in mind, the church did not start in Canterbury. It didn't start in Rome. It came there. It left Jerusalem. It left Rome. It can leave Canterbury. What I've seen and heard in Nigeria is deeply troubling. African church leaders are not just targeting black worshippers in Britain, they want to reform the whole social and religious scene, and they see the liberal church as the enemy. There's no room at all for compromise over issues like homosexuality and abortion, and no chance at all that these issues are going to go away. There's an almighty battle looming in Britain, and there's bound to be casualties. These people are wrong. It is not acceptable to have them in the church. Their opinions and views are not compatible with the Christian faith as we proclaim it here. 
there are some very difficult questions I need to tackle. Will African fundamentalism continue to spread through Britain? God is, is now speaking to African missionaries to actually ensure that we spread the gospel throughout the world. What will be its impact on the church? It's a battle for the heart and soul of the, uh, of, of the Church of England. And on society at large. But above all else, can the Church of England possibly survive? In the last 10 years, there have been seismic shifts in the Christian world. Africa has become a religious superpower, and African church leaders are now attempting to dictate terms to the West. Where was the church when people began to turn against God? Where was the church when the parliament decided to make Sunday a working day and not a worshiping day? Where was the church? In Britain, the rise of African Christianity has provoked nothing less than a civil war in the Church of England, with liberals and fundamentalists fighting for control of it. They define their religiosity and their self-righteousness by having someone whom they can hate and condemn. It's a battle for the heart and soul of the, uh, of the Church of England. It is actually about prejudice, for which another word is bigotry, for which another word is hatred. Who will win the battle? And what will happen to the losers? What does the future hold for Britain now that God is black? The Church of England is in crisis. Congregations are plummeting and churches are simply crumbling away. That's amazing. I mean, it really kind of pains me to see church buildings like this. This is devastating. Places like Westminster Abbey help the church to keep up the appearance of confidence and authority. But that's all based on the very distant past. In the Anglican faith, times are changing fast. Look around at this place. You've got statues of the good and the great. You've got stained glass windows all around the place. And near enough, every case, all of them are white. Now, that may have been an accurate picture of how things were 100, even 500 years ago, but it's not the case today. It's not a church that is just of white people within Britain. It's a predominantly black church and predominantly African at that. My name's Robert Beckford, and I'm a theologian. On my recent travels in Africa, I've discovered a form of Christianity that's vibrant, ambitious and deeply moral. 
and it plays a central part in almost everyone's life. Couldn't be more different to the Christianity we know in England. I was walking around the Abbey gift shop this afternoon and I found this. This little porcelain bell with a picture of the Abbey on it. I thought to myself, what the heck has this got to do with Christianity in the world today? Is this what the Anglican Church has reduced itself to? Selling ornaments with no real function. Is that how it understands itself? An ornament? I'm sure that in West Africa, where Christianity is a matter of life and death, people aren't bothered with little things like this. They want a faith that's meaningful, that actually means something within the world. African Christianity is fundamentalist Christianity. At times, I found it frighteningly extreme. It has many different guises, but they're all driven, uncompromising, and heading this way. This is the Reverend Moutet. He's come from Africa and he's in Bradford to bring the British back to Christ. I find myself in the UK today as a missionary. I come to a beautiful church like this one which is almost empty. And what I think is, oh, I think it's better for me to go to Africa because the churches are full. That's not the issue. The issue is I have to start my mission now. shocked you about um, uh, the kind of uh, spirit about the spiritual state of Britain I think when I came I, I thought maybe uh, the people have abandoned the church that's what I that's what came into my mind I thought when I looked at these empty churches I said there's something wrong here you know where have they gone to like when you look at Africa you say oh we are like I've been saying we are who we are because of the missionaries said, okay they came to Africa they gave us this message so what, what and yet when you come here it's a different thing altogether do you feel proud about what God is doing in Africa? This is why I'm here. God is, is now speaking to African missionaries to actually ensure that we spread the gospel throughout the world. All what I am about to do and what I feel I'm likely to do in England as a missionary is to teach the Bible as it is, not the wishy-washy type of preaching. If you do not want to hear what the Bible says, tough luck. Missionaries like Father Moutet are determined to bring African Christianity to all parts of Britain. But in some areas, forms of African Christianity are already thriving. The whole place is alive, it's dynamic. The people are really excited about being in church. Can you believe that? It's Sunday morning and people are actually amazingly excited about being here. This is the Kingsway International Christian Centre on an ordinary Sunday morning. It was set up by another African missionary. Stretch your hand towards the offering and confess with me, Lord, as we give our offerings today. We believe you for better jobs. Raises and bonuses. Interest and income. Gifts and surprises. Finding money. Benefits. Settlements. Estates and inheritances. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. I've never heard so much talk of money in a church. Pastor Matthew would argue that there's a sound biblical basis for it, but I find it troubling. I've been keeping a video diary on my journey. And this is what I recorded after I'd been to Kingsway. Is this really what the gospel is all about? Pastor Matthew is preaching.
preaching a, th a thing called prosperity doctrine. I believe in giving money to the church, but he seems to have taken it onto another level where he believes that God is a bank. You give a big gift of money to God, and in return, God gives you lots of money back. And I've always thought that the greatest gift was love. I've seen this kind of thing before. It's just like some of the churches I found in Africa. That was a very impressive setup at Kingsway. But there was such an emphasis on giving money. Check this out. It's the envelope that people use to put their money in that they're giving to the church. You can pay by cash or by credit card. And they offer you Visa, MasterCard, Delta, and Switch. If everybody in that church, 6,000 people, are given a percentage of their income to that church every week, just imagine how many hundreds of thousands of pounds are being raised by Kingsway every month. Jesus knew why he was on this planet. He didn't commit himself to everything. Jesus said in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save. Pastor Matthew came to Britain as a missionary from Nigeria and set up Kingsway just 12 years ago. I wanted to know the secret of his success. This building is the overflow building. Yeah, this is a temporary structure which holds 2,000 people. So, so, so just your overflow tent itself has 2,000 seats? Yeah, it has 2,000 seats and wasn't even enough. So, so hold on, so you've got 4,000 in there, <laughs> 2,000 here, and another 2,000 children somewhere else. You're looking, you're looking nearly 10,000 people at worship on yes, Sunday in, morning. In, in our Sunday morning service, we're close to 10,000. Yes, yes, yes. The transport department handles the 21 church vans we have. But we're hoping to expand on the number of vans to like 40 before the end of the year. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. Our TV program is broadcasted in almost all of Africa, three Caribbean nations, all of Europe, 84 million American homes, about 14 million homes in India, and very soon into Hong Kong. There are aspects of this place that seem to me more like a business than a church. Even when he was just showing me around, Pastor Matthew had a retinue of PR people, assistants, and bodyguards. It was like spending time with Donald Trump or Richard Branson. When you think of your average Church of England church on a Sunday morning, there's no comparison. And Pastor Matthew's aiming even higher. There are 300 books here. They're all about church growth. Right. I believe that there's nothing wrong with dreaming for 25,000 people to come to church. I believe that uh, it just gives us the opportunity to have greater witness, greater impact, and to do more. Mm. If this success had appeared in another color, maybe people have been celebrated. But I also think that the time has come for somebody to say, wait a minute, let's look beyond the color. Maybe we have something to learn from this man, and it might just start a national phenomenon of church growth around the land. Bless you. Hi. Pastor Matthew's an impressive man, even if you don't buy into the emphasis he puts on wealth and success. I think his collection of eagles and swords says quite a lot about him. They're clear symbols of power and conquest. His approach to Christianity is nothing short of a crusade, and it looks to me like it's going to transform the way we do God in this country. I want to know what impact people like Pastor Matthew are having on the Church of England. It's already on its knees, and I'm wondering if it can possibly survive.
I want to know how the rise of fundamentalist Christianity in Africa is impacting on Christianity in Britain. I've heard that British evangelicals see it as a cause for celebration. I'm on my way to an evangelical conference to find out why. We're not a homophobic church. If he teaches it, it's just as bad as practicing. Paul in Acts 20 tells us that false teachers will rise up from among us. Appointment of Ron Williams is a serious problem. The battle is on, uh, and the gospel will win. These people belong to an organization called Reform. There is a refreshing clarity in the doctrinal and moral understanding of the church in the developing world. And it is from there that the coup against the equivocal Anglicanism of England can be expected to issue. Not much force will be needed to flatten the Church of England as a coherent religious institution. It is a house of cards. I had to come outside and take a break and gather my thoughts. It's absolutely amazing some of the things that they're saying in there. They say that the teachings of the Archbishop of, Can of Canterbury are false teachings. As far as I'm concerned, they may as well say that the man is the Antichrist because that's a job of the Antichrist to lead the church into falseness and, and error. But the most striking thing is what they said about Africa. Now consider the fact that in almost every other part of the, this country, when people think of Africa, they think of death, disease, starvation and failed states. But that's not the case with reform. For them, Africa is central to their struggle for victory within the Church of England. At least that's the way it seems to me. Over dinner, I asked two of the organisers of the event if my impressions were correct. Why does African Christianity figure so large in their thinking? Are you buoyed and encouraged? by the fact that there are so many conservative evangelicals in places like well, Africa and within we, the Anglican we Church. Draw, we draw tremendous heart from the fact that the position we hold, which is actually orthodox Anglicanism, mm. historically and around the world, is not a minority position. We are, in fact, all part of a mainstream orthodox historic Ang uh, Christian faith. Yeah. We spent some time with um, the Archbishop of Nigeria, yeah. um, Akinola. Is that where you're looking to well, for leadership? Clearly, and uh, at the last two um, annual conferences we've had, well, the last one in particular, we had a bishop from Nigeria coming. So it would be perfectly true to say that um, they are becoming increasingly influential, perhaps major, mm. in the Anglican communion. I feel very conscious of the fact that I'm the only black guy in here. This seems like a very white suburban group of people. So I have to say, it seems very strange to me that they're looking to black Africans for leadership. I can't help thinking that this admiration for Africa is opportunistic. I think they see themselves as the last ditch defenders of the Church of England, besieged on every side. And they're looking to Africa as the cavalry. Do you feel like you're in the middle of a battle? Very much so. It's a battle for the heart and soul of the, uh, of, of the Church of England. And um, the reason why it's so important to us is because what's at stake is the authority of God's word. If there's a battle taking place, who's got the upper hand, the liberals or the evangelicals? Well, I don't want to see that. Uh, Jesus is Lord. He is Lord of his church, and, and thank God that God is sovereign well, but and gracious. That's, that's all very easy kind of um, language to use when we, talk, you know, when we gloss it over that way. But come on, in reality, there's a battle well, taking place. And who, in my who, first year, in my who, first year, who's got the upper hand? In my first year as chairman, I visited every reform group in the country, from, from Carlisle down to Cornwall. My overwhelming impression was that the vast majority of lay Christians yeah. within the Church of England are essentially orthodox, essentially conservative. They may be fairly um, inarticulate, not well taught, but that is essentially where they are. And they are perplexed and dismayed by those in leadership, those in responsibility, apparently not, apparently not being orthodox and not standing up for them. I think they're talking about the Archbishop of Canterbury and his false teachings again.
what, but what does this then mean for the future of the Church of England? Where do you see the church going within the next decade or two? The, the important thing is to say that the future, unless it's resolved by firm leadership now, committed to the Bible, unless that's the way it's resolved, the future is going to be messy. I think this is really aggressive stuff. They all seem to be really pumped up and ready for a fight. The future will be messy, they said. Now, that seems to me to be a clear, unambiguous threat. Liberals would do well to listen very carefully because the evangelicals are on the march. These days, you don't just find evangelicals in small organizations like Reform, but in national movements like Alpha. This is Nicky Gumbel. As you can see, he's a very smooth operator. From his hand movements, you'd think he was a new Labour backbencher. But he's actually the most powerful man in Christianity in Britain. He has more people on staff than the Archbishop of Canterbury. What do you think of Nicky Gumbel? He's fantastic. He's just inspiring for everyone and uh, I love listening to him, I love reading his books. The Alpha Course that he founded has grown at an amazing rate. It's been incredibly successful and it's the success story of evangelical Christianity in this country. I just found myself thinking, yes, 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 you know, this is, this is, this is true. What interests me most about the presentation of Nikki is the fact that it's a, it's a really good brand. He comes across the same in every video, so you know exactly what you get when you see him. He has a good way of delivering um, and to reach people's hearts. He is the acceptable face of evangelical fundamentalist Christianity in Britain. I want to get behind the brand and find out what Alpha is really all about. What happens at Alpha? What do they actually believe in? And how come it's so enormously popular? This week, we're looking at the other side of that relationship. How does God communicate with us? When you come to an Alpha evening, the first thing that happens is someone gives you food. And then later, there's singing and praying and lots of little discussion groups that tackle some of the big issues in Christianity. Who is Jesus? What is the Holy Spirit? And so on. But you'll have to take my word about those bits, because Alpha are very keen to control their public image, and our access was heavily restricted. We're not allowed to film the small group meetings or the prayer or the worship that's taking place. So I've snuck out and come downstairs to see what I can learn about the place from having a wander around the bookshop. Can we take a look at this? This is some of the alpha paraphernalia. There are videos, DVDs and books here. 30 different languages going out all over the place. It just shows how corporate and how polished and media savvy these people are. I want to make sure that people see alpha as a real brand. It's not too diff different from what I've seen in the black majority churches where they try and run the church like a mini corporation, bringing in hundreds of thousands of pounds and making sure that the church is a financial institution. In fact, much of what I've seen at Alpha reminds me of black churches. I wanted to know from Nicky Gumbel if he's consciously imitating the black tradition. It's not a direct in inspiration, but I think what, what we are doing is, is proclaiming the same gospel and the gospel of Jesus Christ has power to change people's lives. And there's also an emphasis on the Holy Spirit, and it's the experience of the Holy Spirit, I think, which is particularly significant for many young people today, actually to experience the love of God. Is healing and the gift of tongues part of the ministry of Alpha? What we, what we speak about on, on the weekend is, is the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and the, the work of the Holy Spirit involves the fruit of the Spirit and also the gifts of the Spirit. And we talk about all the gifts of the Spirit, which includes a whole lot of range of gifts, including healing and speaking in tongues and prophecy and, and all the other gifts which the Holy Spirit gives and which bring blessing to the church. This seems very significant to me. 
I believe the presence of things like prophecy and healing on the Alpha Course show how close it is to the kind of Christianity I encountered in Africa. I, I personally uh, hold to the traditional teaching of the church. At the heart of, of, of Alpha is, is, we believe, obviously, the orth orthodox Christian faith, the beliefs which have been held by Christians for, for thousands of years, not thousands of years, well, yeah. 2,000 yeah, two two years, so it, is yeah. two, it is, many mm -hmm. hundreds of years, yeah. uh, 2,000 years, uh, and which are the things about which, which we, we, we can unite. I think that Nikki and Alpha are evidence of the way in which evangelical Christianity has become a dominant force on the world stage now that Africa has the loudest voice. It's said that over six million people have taken Alpha in its ten-year history. Now everybody here looks young, successful, normal, there's nobody in stripy pullovers. And it just goes to show how mainstream fundamentalist Christianity actually is. This is all good news for the evangelicals, but I'm not sure it's so great for society. Because what many evangelicals seem to want above all is to turn the clock back 50 years to a time when Britain was a much more rigid and intolerant place. It got me thinking about the gay men I met on Lagos Beach during my recent travels in Nigeria. The fundamentalist society they belong to has got them living in fear. What's life like for gay people in Nigeria? Life for gay people in Nigeria is really, really horrible. It's something that you don't even mention to anybody here. You don't just let anybody know this is what you do. Otherwise, you'll be skinned alive. Is religion partly responsible for the, the kind of homophobia within the country? Yes, it's, it's a very, very strong yeah. impact. It, most of them believe that the practice of homosexual is satanic, it's evil. Demonic. It's demonic. And it's, sometimes they say they want to deliver you. Yeah. What have they got to deliver you from? There's a pronounced homophobia within African Christianity and in light of the African Evangelical Alliance, that's something we should be very concerned about in Britain. Man shall not live with man. It's an abomination. Don't do it. Mm. The mission of the church is to say no to what God says no. It doesn't matter who is involved. No matter who tries to promote it. If God says it's not right, the church will stand firm and say it's not right. Who we'll accept it? Are these really the sort of values we want to be governed by? The whole point of the liberal church in Britain is to protect us against this sort of thing, to keep Britain tolerant and inclusive. So I want to know what liberal Christians are doing to stand up to the Evangelical African Alliance. Who is championing the liberal cause? Maranatha. Who is going to save Christianity from a return to the Dark Ages? When we're ready, just open our eyes. It doesn't look promising.
This is a typical liberal church service in the East Anglian countryside. There are no drums and no clapping, no screens or cameras like you might find in an evangelical church. Just quiet prayer, gentle hymns and a reassuring sermon. And this is Reverend Sally Fogden, one of the first women priests to be ordained in Britain. I've come here to find out how the crisis in the Church of England and the rise of African Christianity look through liberal eyes. How do you feel about African Christianity now being the dominant force on the world stage? Well, I think that is, is, is fine, provided, as with any kind of Christianity, it doesn't try to dominate everyone else and say, we're very powerful, this is the way you must be. Do you not feel you're part of a battle between evangelicals and liberals within the UK? No, not at all. I, I don't feel that I'm a part of a battle at all. I feel what I'm part of is a great organisation that is very broad, that is trying to show the love of God rather than uh, the um, powerfulness of God. You see, we do not want to dominate. We want to work with. We want to be part of and to be inclusive. I really like Sally, but I think she's quite naive. She said she doesn't want to be in a battle, but according to the African and evangelical leaders that I've met, they've made it clear that she's definitely in one. Now, they do want to dominate, and they see liberals like Sally as being the enemy. Why do you think the evangelicals are so keen to boast about church numbers and the amount of people attending their congregations? I don't know, and, and I really quite wish I did. Um, personally, I'm more concerned with what those who come to church are doing outside church uh, and what they're doing in their lives to, through their work and through whatever they do to help people understand that uh, the love of God is relevant for everyone and for all time. But surely you'd like to see churches full? Of course I'd like to see churches full, but I'm not that bothered about it. I'm not going to go out like a chi the child catcher in Titty Titty Bang Bang and drag them all in, but I'm going to welcome them when they come. I can't believe that she's just said that. Gaining numbers is how you take control of the church. Now, the softly, softly approach advocated by Sally is actually losing numbers, whereas those who take their lead from Africa are actually booming. I couldn't help thinking of the African missionary I met in Bradford. For him, numbers are everything. Within the next 10 years, if God willing, things can change. This church can be full. I can see that. Because there's no way I can be a minister here if I can't see that sort of improvement. I can actually see that if evangelism takes its toll and we go out into the world with the help of those people who are also seeing God the way I'm seeing him, I think we can fill this church. That's the way I look at it. It seems to me that no one on the ground is very worried about the future of the Liberal Church. I wanted to know how things look to people higher up the ladder than Sally. Aren't they worried? This is Mike Hill, the Bishop of Bristol. What do you see as the future of the Church in England? Well, I mean, you know, as the advertisement says, the future's bright, you know, I don't think it's orange, but it's rosy. I don't think the future is purely evangelical-shaped or purely liberal-shaped. And, and, and I try to not look at the church as a kind of battlefield, although sometimes it's difficult not to. Um, I, I don't feel myself in a pitch battle trying to, you know, win the liberals over to my point of view or win the evangelicals over to my point of view. What I see is a nation where I profoundly believe that the church has got a lot to offer. Bishop Mike is a senior figure, but he seems just as sanguine as Sally. I worry that the Liberals aren't taking the threat from fundamentalism at all seriously. Why do you feel evangelicals have done so much better than Liberals in the UK? Probably evangelicals have been a little better at marketing uh, than the Liberal wing of the church. And, and um, that's not to say that one's dead and the other's alive. I just think it starts from a different kind of uh, you know, basis of questioning. So the kind of world in which we live is one where actually 
It's not the ideas you have, it's how you promote those ideas uh, and, and, you know, whether you do that with any savvy or not. So how would you market the liberal church more effectively in the fight against the Evangelical African Alliance? What are its best selling points and what would you need to gloss over? This is one of London's leading ad agencies. I'm going to ask them to design a campaign to sell the liberal church. And this is Debbie Homeyard. For Debbie, boosting liberal congregations is much more than an abstract exercise because she's a real liberal vicar, working on the front line in Bishop Mike's diocese in Bristol. Central to the marketing is, is this man, is Jesus. I mean, how, how do we, how do we, not, not, not particularly this one, not particularly this one with a, with a you know, a, but, but if we're going to market, Chris, I mean, what, what I'd be interested to know is how do we sell Jesus? People are saying, well, what's, what's the church got for me? There's, there's not much going on. It just seems to have lost relevance. They may see themselves as liberal, but I still think a lot of people outside of that congregation see it as quite traditional, conservative, middle-aged. It's cold, you've got to sit upright on these rigid benches, you have these high echoey ceilings, it's freezing. But you, get, you do get kind of, you know, little mafia groups of little old ladies that rule the roost in a particular parish, or, and, and that is very off-putting to newcomers. What's the uh, reputation of uh, this area? Well, I think this area has a reputation for um, a lot of crime um, and increasingly for drug problems, which is really sad. Just make sure you're relaxed and your backs are straight. We'll close our eyes gently. The phone box that we're looking at, just there, what, that's maybe 30 meters away, is one of the notorious drug dealing spots. People go and phone up from there. And just gently, silently start to repeat the mantra, ma ra na -tha. One of Debbie's ideas to regenerate the church in her area is meditation. Given you've got this tough neighbourhood, mm. you've got social deprivation, mm. you've got drug dealing just outside the church, mm. is meditation really going to help? Well, I don't know about the meditation, but I think God can help. Um, and I think that's just a way of, of getting in touch with God, whether you meditate, whether you pray in different ways. I don't think it matters. People want a spiritual part of their life. Um, and even if that's down to just uh, the, the feelings that, that going to something like a spa gives them, you know, a sense, of, a, a sense of well-being, a sense of calmness, a sense of kind of being at one with themselves. Church needs to shake up some of its existing audience as well because I think they're so desperate to cling on to the few they have left yeah, and the yeah, fewer church yeah, attenders that yeah. have left. There should be a really strong role for religion. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just about positioning uh, religion as, as meeting those needs. If they want people to discover the Holy Spirit, then they have to get them in, engaged in the church in the first place. Don't you think a more evangelistic ministry where you're looking to get people into the church would be the best way to deal with some of the problems? I, well, I think, yes, the more people we could get into the church, the better. And um, the meditation is, is only one thing, and that's a small thing. We do lots of different meals and activities and social events and things which we try and invite people into the church but Isn't, for, isn't that all a bit quaint? Yeah. I mean, you've got drug dealers straight outside there, you've got people selling crack cocaine up there, you've got a, a woman across the road who's been attacked, uh, her husband's been attacked by a mad, drugged up, um, hammer wielding person. I mean, is it enough to be offering people food and meals and being so, so nice? Don't you need to be a little bit tough, a little bit more militant, getting the gospel out there? Well, I think in some ways, yes, I mean, that, that would be great. Um, I don't think I'm a very militant person. At the ad agency, we're focus grouping our ideas for a campaign to save the Liberal Church. It's a slick and business-like approach to the church's problems. He's a drug to be avoided. He's a human being. Should you be a bit, little bit more market savvy, a little bit clearer about the brand that you have? Again, I suppose I want to try and go back to biblical principles. When, when you ask me questions Don't like that, I'm bring the Bible into this. <laughs> Work it out yourself. Thinking, you, you, you've, what, got, what you've got a brand that need, the people do. need to know. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so your, your, your brand is 
Jesus. And uh, I would go back again and think, well, what did Jesus do? He didn't conform to what was popular at the time. I think that Debbie's heart's in the right place, but that's just not enough to stop the march of the African Evangelical Alliance. Unless the liberals get to grips with the modern world and take on board the power and importance of marketing, I reckon they'll be sitting around meditating when the liberal church has shrunk away to nothing. Standing by. This is the advert we came up with at St. Luke's. I think for the liberal church, it would be a big step in the right direction. Will somebody wear me to the bed? Will a lady pin me in her hair? Will a child find me by a string? Now I certainly believe that going to church can change your perspective, but there's one issue on which the evangelicals, the liberals and the Africans alike just won't shift. And it stepped up the conflict between them into an all-out war. People have been predicting the death of the Church of England for decades, and it's always somehow stood firm. But the rise of African fundamentalism has reawakened an old controversy, and it's threatening to blow the church apart. Oh, no, that is really fascinating. That's a traditional depiction of Jesus on the cross. But if the truth was told, when most prisoners were crucified. They were actually crucified naked and in many cases with an erection. But what we find here is an attempt to cover up that his genitalia and for me that symbolizes the church's inability to deal with the sexuality of Jesus and sexuality in general. But look at that torso. It's almost perfect and almost erotic in some ways. It's that perfect tension within the church between this homoerotic image of Jesus 
but yet this inability to deal with his sexuality. As Britain has become a more and more gay-friendly nation, the issue of homosexuality has made the divisions between evangelicals and liberals clearer than ever. Why is homosexuality such a big issue in Anglicanism? Well, one of the reasons is because the Bible is so clear about it. It says, and we try to reflect this in our Reformed Covenant, it says that all sexual, sexual activity, sexual activity outside uh, heterosexual marriage mm. is outside the will and blessing of God. Right. And for some reason it has become the one question test of orthodoxy for contemporary fundamentalists. Is this person friend or foe? Ask them what they think about homosexuality. The reason why it's so important is because it challenges the authority of God's word, and that's what the church is founded on. If we lose go of that, then we've lost everything. It is based on prejudice and false assumptions, a huge long list of false assumptions. And at the end of the day, when they work themselves up into this being their big issue, it is actually about prejudice, for which another word is bigotry, for which another word is hatred. How would you respond to those who think this is nothing more than just prejudice about, against gay and lesbian men and women? Well, I, I think we'd want to say, first of all, that God loves everybody without exception and whatever their sexuality. There are no second-class citizens so far as God's love is concerned. But the second thing is that God never expects us to carry on as though we'd never come across him when we become Christians. He expects us all to change and expects us to become more like Jesus Christ. Serious disagreements over homosexuality have been around a long time, but traditionally the church has managed to smooth them over. And this is where it happens. It's the general synod and it's a temple to fudgery. This is a really significant space. It's designed to represent the unity of the church. It's a, a circle. It's like being in the womb. I mean, even the roof itself is curved so that you're encapsulated in this space. It's no wonder that so many compromises are reached within this building. It just forces everybody to bridge the gap, find points of contact, and make peace. But the church has suddenly found itself way past the point of making peace over the gay issue. On the 2nd of November last year, this man, the openly gay Canon Jean Robinson, became a bishop in America. The eyes of the world are on us. Let's use every inch of it. We couldn't buy this kind of publicity. African church leaders were outraged and called for America to be ejected from the Anglican Church. The Worldwide Anglican Communion, which has always embraced both evangelical and liberal churches, had started to fall apart. The church did not start in Canterbury. It didn't start in Rome. It came there. It left Jerusalem. It left Rome. It can leave Canterbury unless they preserve the truth of the gospel. This is the biggest crisis in the 500-year history of the Church of England, and nobody knows what the fallout will be. My prediction is that the Church of England as we know it is as good as dead. The fundamentalists have already taken over the inner city, and the liberals have gone out into the countryside. The rise of African Christianity has made it impossible for the two sides to live together in one church. And now that the basic unity of the Anglican Church has been destroyed, it seems to me that it's only a matter of time before African Christianity forces the church to fragment entirely into dozens of churches, each with their own specialist area. In the current climate, anyone who's unhappy with the status quo can simply peel away and go it alone. And that's what makes niche churches like this one a vision of the future. Looking great God, this time and this special day, set aside.
It's the Metropolitan Community Church, the MCC, in North London. And it caters specifically for gays and lesbians. I started to do a lot of research for this sermon because I knew Robert would be here, you know, and he's a, he's a, a well-renowned theologian, you know, and I wanted to show my theology chops to Robert today. Uh, Robert, I didn't do it. I'm sorry. I, decided, I got halfway through it, and I just decided that the most important thing that we have to offer, the theology that matters, are the true stories of our encounters with Christ and what Christ is doing in our lives. And we remind ourselves that every single person can be a blessing in this world and is a blessing in this world. And that is our gospel mandate. Why is the church universal tearing itself apart? Pretending that homosexuals or homosexuality is the problem when homophobia, transphobia, racism, classism, these are the things tearing the church apart. Amen? I think this says a great deal about the congregation here, the MCC. It's a packet of condoms and they hand them out to every person who attends on a Sunday. You see, if churches are fragmented, there's the opportunity to meet the particular needs of each congregation, and in this case, it's sexual health. I've been to lots of services that have been incredibly broad and bland, and not really saying anything in particular. But when you have smaller, fragmented churches, you can get down to business. So many of our folks um, have been wounded by other churches, have been told by other churches that they can't be there, that, um, that we've created the space. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's partly about meeting that need. I think the MCC represents both the future of the church and the end of it. It confirms that a church fragmented by the rise of African Christianity can survive and even prosper. But it will be followed by churches that are split along the lines of men and women, doctors and dustmen, middle class and working class. I think it's really quite ironic that the Christianization of Africa, which was a central plank in the Victorian dream of a worldwide Christian church would be the part of the church that ultimately destroys it.